Kim Coates from the Scriber Media Center. And as everyone knows, there's an election coming up. So today I'll be talking with Shelby Chung. She is the uh, liberal candidate for the Thunder Bay Superior North riding. Am I right? Absolutely. Welcome and thanks for dropping in the Media Center to have a chat with us. Thank you so much and thanks for showing me around. So Shelby, tell us a little bit about yourself. Will you come from Thunder Bay? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Thunder Bay. Uh, if anyone knows Thunder Bay area, I grew up in the East End. Um, yeah, family, uh, four brothers, uh, girl in the middle. Um, they were all my, my little gang. So they, uh, yeah, we just, we, uh, had a charmed life living in the East End and, uh, lived in a three bedroom house. It was, yeah. Nice. So you were born and raised in Thunder Bay then? Yeah. Yeah, I was. Um, yeah, grew up at, yeah, grew up in East End and I went to Ogden Street School, went to Fort William Collegiate School, which is now closed. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have, um, you know, my, my, both my parents were like my, my father worked, my mom stayed home. Um, there was really no one in our family that went to university after. I, I don't think either of my parents graduated high school. Uh, so the next thing to do after you graduate high school, it's like, okay, what's everybody doing? <laughs> well, I guess I'll go to this university thing. And I, I went to university and uh, ended up getting a degree in political science. First day of university, um, I go into, if anybody knows at Lakehead University, I go into the pub and uh, there's, you know, 18-year-old Shelby looking around trying to figure out where she belongs and everybody's just watching TV. I'm like, what's on TV? It must be like a sports game or something. Probably the news. It was the news. <laughs> September 11th, 2001. Oh my God. My first day of political science class. Wow. Yeah. And it completely changed, like it opened up my eyes because I mean, I just, I was from Thunder Bay. It's a mm -hmm. small world in Thunder Bay. It's, um, so I didn't, I didn't know much about anything. I mean, the jury's still out on whether I know anything now, but, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And that is kind of just kind of set my, my course for, for this. Now, what motivated you to take that as a study? Uh, you know what? It actually, I thought about this before and, uh, so great. It was grade five class, Miss, Miss Ann Boo's class. Uh, she, she did this exercise with us back, I think it was 1996. Uh, it was a federal election. So you have the Conservatives, uh, which had Kim Campbell, first female mm -hmm. uh, Prime Kim Minister. Yeah. Um, she was only there for a nanosecond, but, yeah. you know, as, as a girl, I had to be like, oh, Kim Campbell. Like, part mm -hmm. of me was was happy that there was female representation. Yeah. But then we also had Jean Chrétien on the other side. And <laughs> so she had uh, the teacher, um, it, like, very, like, progressive idea. Like, uh, she had us cut these uh, stories out of the newspaper about politics, and we had to come and put them on a political spectrum whether they were left or, or right mm. or somewhere in the center and like what they're talking about. And we talked about these, these issues and there was this campaign that the conservatives came out with that came, made fun of Jean Chrétien about how he spoke. Yeah. How he spoke. And uh, they were like, is this the face of Canadian leadership or something horrible like that? Mm. I was mortified. Mm. I was absolutely mortified that someone would He's take a part. Me. Yeah. And, and Jean Chrétien was so stoic, and he just said, I'd rather speak out of one side of my mouth than both sides of my mouth. And I just had a meltdown. I'm like, this guy's my hero. <laughs> and so I've kind of identified as a liberal ever since because I feel like that, that liberal, those liberal values, they stand up for people, and they, they speak the truth. And they, yeah, and it was it was a great moment. And that kind of, you know, ignited this, this interest in politics. And, uh, yeah. So uh, what did you do after school? Once you graduated, what were you up to? So I finished my four-year honors degree in political science, mm -hmm. and I said, I'm never going to do politics. I was just, nope, I did. this is too much for me. Um, you know, in your early 20s, you don't have a, a, I still didn't have a sense of myself, didn't travel really anywhere. Um, I, I actually got a job at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, and I was an administrative assistant. So it was like, I think they were they just opened. So I got in uh, just as they were still building the school and um, I worked there for almost seven years ended up getting pr promotion I was a medical education coordinator for a while um, in that time I, I bought a house and I got married and um, you know you're living the life right on mm -hmm. paper it mm -hmm. all looks great on paper because mm -hmm. my mom like she my mom um, she didn't work she felt very stuck at home mm -hmm. uh, she learned to read when I was you know into my teens um, she always stressed to me the importance of an education. She's like, get in a union, become a police officer, buy your own jewelry, mm. buy your own cars, don't depend on a man. <laughs> like, and yeah, like, I heard this almost every day of my life growing up, just don't depend on people, just yeah. do it yourself. Yeah. 
And so I'm like, okay, mom, okay, okay, okay. I got the job, I've got the car, I got the, the house, the, all the things, all the check boxes. She was instilling independence in you. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know what? I, I tell myself, I'm never going to be like my mom. And then I wake up and I'm saying things that she says. And I'm like, <laughs> ah, it's fun. I love my That mom. happens. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, actually, my mom's from uh, from Red Rock, mm -hmm. so she's got all kinds of connections there. And uh, yeah, so anyway, we, um, uh, I just I wasn't happy. Sitting at a desk is not for me. Mm. And uh, so as I was getting married, um, I was looking for a wedding dress, and I've always loved sewing and stuff. But again, my mom's like, "There's no money in that. Become a police officer, mm -hmm. a union, <laughs> something like." So I'm like, "Okay, okay." So uh, I just never thought that was an option for mm. me. And then I. Uh, I started thinking about like we need a wedding dress shop because like all the you know the, the the people who own the the shops in in Thunder Bay and even in the region you start seeing like they wanted to retire they were selling off closing down and then the next generation they worked at the mill yeah so you have this gap in in business ownership mm -hmm. and uh, I thought this was a really good opportunity to get in and you know the the government had uh, a program called NOHFC that I applied to and uh, they gave me $25,000 to to open up my business. So I had a line of credit that I used, uh, used this seed money from the from the business and I, I just cold called suppliers, wedding dress designers that I liked and they're like, oh, you need to go to Chicago. And they, like, it was just, I built this whole idea in my head and uh, Thunder Bay, uh, the South Core is uh, very socially and economically disadvantaged. Mm. And this from, this where I'm from though, and I'm very proud of those roots. Mm. So when I decided to open my business, I'm like, brides will come from anywhere mm. to, to, to um, it's a destination. So I could be there, have the inexpensive rent because it's largely empty, uh, or at least at the time it was, and then um, started my business. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to get part of the, the business improvement area, you know, clean up the town. Cause, you know, well, it's, yeah, it affects your business. Absolutely. You've you got an interest in it. So I, uh, yeah, I wanted to get part of this business improvement plan and, you know, they were just doing things differently, of course, and they didn't want anything to do with me being on the board and because I had ideas and, um, you know, and then everybody has their, their things and resistant to change. And someone said, why don't you just run for council? At first I was like, no, I did my politics. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I'm, I'm good. Um, but then I started thinking like, okay, who on council at least represents me? Mm -hmm. So two out of 13 on council were female. I think at the time, one out of 13 was a business owner. And there was nobody under 50, I think. Oh, and Andrew Foltz. Mm -hmm. Andrew Foltz is under 50. So there was uh, nobody that you would connect yeah. with on a personal level that you could relate to that said, well, I don't see myself yeah. in that environment. Yeah. So when I, I was looking at this at this group, and I mean, council is what it is because they're all elected people, but mm -hmm. I didn't see myself represented. Mm -hmm. And if I'm like, I don't see myself represented, I'm pretty sure my colleagues opening up businesses are, don't see themselves represented either. And then at the same time, we also had a major flood in my ward. Mm -hmm. um, and because uh, they didn't put money into infrastructure in the 90s. It was just, you know, zero percent increase. And that was the, the mantra back then. We paid for it. Um, so I, I knocked on all the doors. I put my, oh, I first put my name in for council. Knocked on all the doors and I just said, hey, my name is Shelby and how long have you lived here? Tell me your story about the flood. How many years ago was that? Uh, that was in 2014. So that was, uh, I put my name in, I was like the first person to put my name in that year. I was so excited. <laughs> I didn't realize how long 10 months of election campaigning was, <laughs> but now I'm, now it's four weeks and I'm like, I don't have enough time. <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of the story arc of, of how uh, the, the political and the business. So I had my business for nine years. Um, unfortunately, the pandemic was just too much on my business, mm -hmm. and uh, I shuttered the business uh, last August. Let's go back to uh, council for a second. Obviously, you got in. I did get in. Mm -hmm. And what was that like? Uh, it was interesting because I was, um, you know, a, a person that I, I respected at the time uh, came to my shop and said, uh, you know, good job, kid, gave me a pat on the head and said, um, you know, you're, you're not going to get in this time. Nobody ever gets in the first time. And, uh, you know, good luck, but, uh, but, you know, keep trying. And this was uh, three weeks before the election. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I just worked like nine and a half, ten months on a campaign. Mm -hmm. And somebody that I respected that was on council before came in and told me this. And I believed him. Mm -hmm. I just took it hook, line and sinker. But I was, it kind of. I just, it made me angry mm. and I just anger stopped through the north. Well, I mean, I was nice, but like, I just, 
it, it had an effect on me. And, it probably would have um, been a great motivator, though, in a way, too. It was. Yeah. It was. And you know what? I got in, and that person did not. And um, it just, it kind of, like, reframed how I took advice from people. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. So, I got in. Um, I was shocked. On I think the TV News Watch probably has, like, a, a, a some sort of role with me. Like, they're interviewing me, and I'm just like, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> I'm just like... I had no idea. And they're like, okay, cut, cut. Okay, shake it off. Shook it off. And I'm like, okay, I'm happy. Yay. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, <You're in. laughs> I remember because friends of mine were watching uh, live at, in the council chambers. And they were laughing because they're like, yeah, that's that's Shelby. She just, <laughs> <laughs> so you're probably one of the youngest counselors on there. You know what? Uh, Cody Frazier is actually 10 years my junior. So this uh, last council, by far the youngest. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think the second youngest, yeah, was Andrew Folds, because yeah. he's 10 years older than me. Yeah. And then uh, this council, yeah, um, Cody, Cody Frazier's youngest. Oh, okay. Um, how did you find you, uh, your way in that position once you were elected and had to deal with all of the, everything else about what, what council is in Thunder Bay? Yeah, what I found um, very interesting, so in 2014, the first time I was elected, um, out of 13 council members, I was the only new member. So everyone else got back in. Uh, there was one position, uh, Frank Puglia, who was actually on council before, mm -hmm. so he got re-elected, so we called him Frank 2.0. <laughs> so he, he had some idea of what was going on, like just how meetings run and closed session ideas. And like just, so I was the only new one. Mm. Um, some council members, um, just had no time for me. One council member said, couldn't even remember my name for the first year. Mm. Kept calling me Shelly. And I mean, God bless his heart, but like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I was, I had that. And then the other side, I had people wanting to help me, like take me under their wings. So, uh, Paul Pugh, um, like, like we had such great philosophical questions. He would give me books and like ideas and he would challenge me. Uh, Frank Puglia, completely on the opposite side of the spectrum, on the, on the political spectrum, I mean, he would challenge me as well. And um, uh, Joe Verramo, like he, one of my big supporters now, uh, like he's just like, okay, this is the green folder. You need to go here, talk to this person, gave me stories and backgrounds. And um, so I had people there that, you know, I felt like gave me credibility because they not only just gave me the pat on the head, um, they actually challenged my thinking as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, it helped me grow. Uh, so when I got on council, I thought I'd be filling potholes, dealing with the storm sewer. And then within like three months on council, we were hit with uh, the seven youth inquest. Which, oh, yeah. one of the heaviest things that to, to for the eye-opening collective awareness of the city yeah. that I don't think we were ready for, but we needed to do. Yeah. Um, I certainly wasn't ready for it as a new council member. And, you know it was hard to just kind of wrap my head around it. And you're learning, you're building the plane in the sky as you're making decisions, these incremental decisions for this global idea of what the good life looks like in Thunder Bay for everybody, not just white people, but yeah. for, for indigenous our indigenous population as well. And um, learned so much. And it was just talking to people and building relationships. And, you know, it was painful for me because I'm learning under the public microscope as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. And, you know, I made friends and enemies on you know, it's, it's council. Um, but it was definitely a big learning curve. So when I, I got on to council this time, um, so I was reelected in 2018. Um, I obviously knew what was going on and like had, had some idea completely different Thunder Bay from when we were elected in 2014. Mm -hmm. And even now the council that's going to be running again, post pandemic is going to be changed again. So it's, we're constantly reinventing ourselves mm -hmm. every four years. And, it's, it could be a good thing, but, but you also yeah. need some stability from... Right. Well, well in last council, goal. we had seven turnover. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I've, I've made it a point to make sure that the the new council members coming on uh, felt included. And, you know, I mean, some people have their own ideas how they're going to do things and change the world. And that's fine. Um, but, you know, I was always there. Like I, like some council members, like I said, look, I, I disagree with what you're doing. I'm probably going to vote against it. But... If you change your res resolution like this, you can include this piece and that piece. You could be more successful and it could be more complete. Because if I thought they had the votes, like you want to make sure that it's a complete package. Yeah. And so, I mean, sometimes those things bite you because they don't appreciate it. But <laughs> at the same time, like, yeah, you want to make sure that you're still representing everybody, even if you don't agree with their views. Mm -hmm. So now you're in your you were in the second term, obviously, in council. Mm -hmm. And... 
uh, somehow you've decided now you, <laughs> you're going to up your game. <laughs> Tell us a bit about that process of how, how did you end up uh, uh, taking that uh, idea where you're in, council, you're in council in Thunder Bay yeah. to what you're, going, what you're planning to do in the future now? Right. Um, so, uh, as you know, like the Liberals did not do well the last election and uh, pretty much a whole new slate of candidates. Uh, so there's this very interesting group that's running this time, like a post-pandemic thinkers. I'm super excited about. Um, so the the south side, so Thunder Bay um, at a Koken side, um, Bill Morrill represented the Liberal Party last time. Uh, at the NDP, Judith uh, Monteith Farrell is on there now. Um, the the Liberal Party asked me if I would consider running Southside because I did run for the federal nomination in 2019. Um, and that's when uh, uh, Marcus Pulowski was nominated. So went to a nomination meeting. Uh, he was elected as the Liberal representative. So they knew I had Liberal ties. And I mean, it's good because I've, I've been a Liberal like my whole life. So, um, so yeah, at the time it was, uh, they asked me in the fall of last year. And at the time, like I, I just split with my husband. I was just closing up my shop. My dogs died. Like it was, it was a year for me. Mm-hmm. And I said, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to reinvent myself at the same time because I've lost my identity. All the markers that told me I was a business owner, that mm-hmm. I was a wife, mm-hmm. even a dog owner. Mm-hmm. I was just... Well, they say what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or names you. One of the two. <laughs> scars you for life. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when they asked me, it just it didn't feel like the right time for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I said, look, I'll, I'll help on the election campaign. Um, no, no problem. Um, I did move to the the north side of town, so I'm at, I live in Thunder Bay Superior North. You're in the riding. I'm in the riding. I said, you know, I I'll help Michael. I I suspect this would be his last term because he I know he had some health issues. Um, I didn't know to the extent at that time. Um, I said I would love to, you know, be as Luke Skywalker to his Obi Wan. Mm-hmm. You know, take my time, learn four years of Michael things and yeah. all the things and um, yeah, so I I. Resigned myself to resign myself to. Um, I was just going to st- stay working at Matawa, writing some education grants for them, doing some programming. I, was, they've been wonderful to me. Just keep my job in council. Hopefully, that's that was the plan, and maybe get a dog, go back to school, do my masters, kind of reinvent mm-hmm. myself a bit. That was the plan. Mm-hmm. So January to now, or January to early April was the plan. And then, um, you mean like this last four months, January to April? Yeah, yeah, oh that was God. the plan. That was the plan. I'm just going to convalesce, <laughs> chill out, renew my mind, yeah. learn something new. Yeah. Um, I'm like, okay, Michael, let's get going. Like, I'm, I want to get running. Like, like I was going to help him. Mm-hmm. And then um, May uh, or uh, April 5th is when he announced that he was very sick. Mm-hmm. Didn't know to the extent. Had a good chat with uh, both him and uh, actually no. At that point, it was I was just speaking with uh, Larry Joy because he's the um, he was Michael's right hand guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, just kind of checking in, like, hey, do you have somebody in the wings? Like, what's going on? Um, and then a little bit of chatter started happening. Like, what if Michael wasn't there? Mm-hmm. Who's going to be the person? I'm like, somebody's got to step forward. Like, so somebody. So and you know my instinct was like, somebody else will t- will tell me what's going on. Mm. And then uh, you start to realize, you know, like there's the, the, the amount of people who want to run for any level of politics, whether it's municipal, federal, even boards, committees, is oh, this yeah. big. Yeah, this big. people will run from it. Yeah, yeah. run from it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm looking, I'm thinking, on paper, mm. like, I would be the candidate. Mm. Liberal Party member, four-year political science degree, eight years council, nine mm. years over running a business. Like, mm. I, I know a lot of the mayors, like, all throughout the North Shore and uh, up in Greenstone. Like, I, I know who the players are. Um, so I, I grabbed the package. You know, I had it from last time and talking with the, the Ontario Liberal Party in Southern Ontario. They're like, yeah, you know, there's packages out. I assumed other people had the packages and they were working on them just like I was and um had very encouraging conversations with michael about like what like what's going on and i know he's he's very sick right now so i don't want to you know bother him too much but he's he calls me every now and then just checking in and uh yeah i was the candidate that that they chose and uh such a short period of time and um i'm i'm honored to be filling this role 
Uh, it's ma big shoes to fill. Like Michael is an institution unto himself. Michael's done a lot for in our area, and it probably would be very intimidating to even think that you could um, just start in 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 his shadow. Oh, absolutely. Mm. Um, yeah, Michael's a, a little guy cast a big shadow. <laughs> um, and you know what? I th I think that. Uh, you know, I, I've had his blessing and his endorsement, um, which I very much appreciate, and I, I took that to heart. Um, and I, I don't think he would have given it if he didn't believe in in the work that I could do for the for the writing. And I think it's it's time to to rebuild in the writing. Uh, I think it's time to rebuild the party and and honestly rebuild ourselves after coming out of the pandemic. I think we we need some good investment, some good ideas, some some forward thinkers, um, because we can't be left in the position that we had before we just we just can't afford it in the north we can't now you've already started the uh door knocking process let's say the door-to-door -door process um what would you say are some of the issues that people are bringing forward to you and i would ask separately what are some of the issues that your party would see but let's start with um what would some of the issues be that you're hearing from people as you're canvassing right well i've, I've started canvassing in the north first mm -hmm. uh so i'm we're, Spent a few days coming up to uh, to Marathon, Terrace Bay, Scriber. We're going to, heading up to Greenstone right after this interview. Um, and so far, the the issue, um, the one issue I've heard that's kind of uniform across everywhere is the housing issue. Mm. Housing prices have gone up. Uh, there are jobs, like people are trying to make jobs for, uh, you know, like Terrace Bay has, there's work at the, mo uh, the, at the mill there. And uh, there's just no, no houses to buy. And it's, uh, the stock is low, but people want to stay in their houses longer. And, but there's no place to transition. There's, it's kind of this weird place. And that's the piece that needs to move forward to, to enable communities to grow and right size and, and modernize. Uh, so that's, that's the number one issue. Um, of course, every community has their, their own thing. Like, um, uh, we were just talking with Mayor Rick Dumas. Uh, I mean, they, they just got some infrastructure for their, uh, they just finished their, um, senior living complex mm -hmm. um and it, it's great um so i think yeah there's there's some pieces there that might play onto that and uh i think there's some talk about like a port and like there's all kinds of things i good ideas there uh terrace bay um they have their their housing issues uh they have some infrastructure things that they're working on scriber we need to get some sort of industry here to increase the tax base um, and then I've got meetings in Nipigon and Red Rock, so we're going to check in with, with, uh, with those guys as well. But, um, yeah, and as, as far as the party, like, yeah, the, the big thing that stands out for me right now is, uh, you know, I've just had this conversation with my mom, and uh, my mom works at the Thunder Bay Regional Hospital. She, uh, she's a cleaner there, mm -hmm. and uh, she wants to retire. It's, cleaning is physically demanding on your body, and the pandemic, like, she's, it's, it's tough because mm -hmm. it's double time cleaning there. And she wants to retire. So I'm thinking, okay, what kind of system can my can my mom do? Because, like, we didn't have a lot of money. Like, we're from the East End. Like, we're, we don't have these big pension packages or anything. And I start thinking, like, my mom's relatively young now. Like, she's, she's just turning 60. And um, I start thinking, like, what what's my mom's retirement going to look like? Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't imagine putting my mom in a for-profit home. Couldn't imagine it. The... They don't score well. Your risk of dying is much higher than in a, in a, uh, a government-run place. Um, it's just that kind of resonated with me. And I know a lot of people my age that are starting to think about what's going to happen to their parents mm -hmm. and where do their parents want to be. Because being forced to be put into a, a for-profit home and being sold like a commodity to the highest bidder uh, with the lowest paid staff is just not... I think it's not going to be palatable for our aging population. People now are starting to rethink that idea that maybe uh, our parents should be in the environment that they're used to for their mental health as well. Just it's a, it seems to be it's a lot less stress on people. Absolutely. Hit the nail on the head there. You know, it, it said that for-profit housing or for-profit long-term care is the greatest mistake of the 21st century. It's, it doesn't serve us well. The pandemic clearly showed that. We had to call the military in to these for-profit housing. Yeah. Like what, people with bandages on them for three days, dying of dehydration, nobody's feeding them, over-medicated, under-medicated. The list is there. We, we know that this is happening. And yet 
some governments are doubling down, wanting to invest our tax dollars into for-profit housing so that their friends on boards and committees can make the money off of our aging parents. Mm -hmm. At what point can we say, let wait, this is not working? It took a pandemic and the military to come in mm -hmm. to clean up the mess. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. And just, we can't, we can't afford it. We just can't afford to do that. My mother, who's worked so hard to, to scrape out a life coming from not, not having an education, learning how to read, like I was there when she learned how to read. Mm -hmm. And now her destiny now, if things stay the status quo, is to end up in one of these homes. Which I call institutions, but... Yeah. Institutions. Absolutely, yeah. they are institutions. Yeah. And now she, her life is going to be bought and sold on the, mm -hmm. on the open market when you're, you're paying these little PSW workers, these, these kids fresh out of school, burn them out, and then they want to do a different profession. We just, we don't, we don't, the system is... That's failing. It's, it, it's a failure. Yeah. When, when you talk about housing as well, um, you've got a generation right now that is probably at some point wondering when, when in their life are they ever going to have what their parents had? In other words, to be able to buy a house, to afford a house. What solutions could be made available for, like, say, first-time home buyers? That I mean, that's a great question. Um, I, I think the housing supply is an issue. Um, when you, we treat housing globally like it's a commodity and not a human right, I think we, we've set ourselves up for this failure. I think uh, I would like to see other opportunities for people to be able to choose their housing whether or not they live in a co-op, because I've heard great stories come out of CBC recently about uh, different kinds of co-op, and that those co-ops were invested in by liberal governments in the past. Um, and, you know, people are, are wanting that kind of connection in that life, especially after the pandemic. People are wondering, you know, what's important to them and community is important to them. Um, one of the problems in Scriber, of course, is there are a lot of empty lots, but the cost per square foot is prohibitive to building something. I mean, you're looking at a thousand square feet, three hundred thousand dollars for property. When you know, even a year ago, you could buy a house for eighty thousand dollars. That's a bit of a hard sell in an area like Scriber. Uh, it is a massive issue, and it's just the cost of living over time. So, two things on that. When you look throughout history, and you know, we we went from an agricultural to an industrial, our our cost of living. There was never any cost of living. A loaf of bread in 1500s was the same in 1600s, same in 1700s, mm -hmm. 1800s. And you start seeing this uptick, like slight uptick. And then there was an annual in inflation. And it, inflation is, is rising on the daily. Like it's probably one of 3% just us sitting here. Mm -hmm. Like I'm being hyperbolic, but you can understand my point. Uh, the cost of everything is going up. And then I actually read this interesting book. It's called The Fourth Turning. Because during the pandemic, I had obviously some time. My shop was closed. I'm trying to think of what to do. So I read this book. And the theory is, is that every 80 years, we start over again. So we, so we have some big catastrophic event. And I can't remember the, the four phases. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out when in history have we experienced this before, this collective pandemic. And every 100 years, we've experienced a pandemic, whether it be cholera, Ebola, like the, the, the list goes on. And right now, we're, we, we've just experienced a pandemic. But what comes after the pandemic? And it's always high inflation. We've got another Roaring Twenties coming. You, I was just about to say the Roaring Twenties is the next thing, the next obvious... Uh... We know what's going to happen next. It's just like we know winter's going to happen. We, we don't know the day winter's going to start. I mean, technically, we have a spot on the calendar, but we don't know how much snow we're going to get. It's going to be a light snow. So we, we know it's going to be cold. But how do we, how do we then ride that wave? And that, that's what I'm here to do. That's, that's why I'm representing, because I'm going to study that next wave mm -hmm. and make sure that we're, we're prepared. Yeah. Uh, you know, talking with some of the communities, um, you know, a couple of years ago in, in one of the, the northern communities, they wanted um, housing, housing for seniors to be able to transition. And they said, no, we don't want this transitional housing. Mm -hmm. They wish they had it yesterday. I know. And they, 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 they take it back. And it's like, well, and, and their council had the foresight. Because, but the community didn't want it, and it was, uh, it's hard. So we, we need to make sure that not only can we, I'm not saying crystal balling and Ouija board economics or whatever, it's, we know it's going to happen. We need to make a plan and move towards it, but not only make a plan, but we need to be able to articulate it well to everyday people so that they're on board as well. Because the world is a very uncertain place. 
we faced all kinds of uncertainties during the pandemic. Like, I don't know if the house that I just bought, being a single woman, is going to be worth anything. Because mm -hmm. is, are they going to drop now? Yeah. No idea. No clue. Yeah. But what I can do is make sure I'm well read. I speak to people and I understand the issues and that I can represent to you in, in Queen's Park. Mm. One of uh, Michael Gravel's pet projects was, of course, the uh, transportation corridor going through here. And everybody knows the problems we have currently with the increase of trucks moving supplies across, um, our winters, the way the roads are, and the conditions of our roads in the winters. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to speak to anything on that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know what? I Driving these roads, like driving even between here and, and Marathon yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, like there's guardrails just missing. Mm -hmm. And because you could see something big went over that and took out the guardrail. It's been a lot so this winter. It's, it's horrible. Absolutely horrible. The road conditions in Northern Ontario are not good. Mm -hmm. Even on a sunny day like yesterday, nice cool conditions like bright sun, like that, that's optimal road conditions. I couldn't imagine campaigning in the wintertime trying to get around, mm -hmm. let alone driving a transport truck trying to deliver goods and services to the communities. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, so I was doing my research before I came up here, and uh, I was thinking, okay, so what are the platform pieces? And I kept seeing this thing, Doug Ford talking about the 413. This Which is in southern Ontario. Southern Ontario. Yeah. Their campaign is to build um, 60 kilometers worth of highway mm -hmm. to get from Toronto to cottage country mm -hmm. to the tune of $10 billion dollars. Ten billion dollars is in the is in the plan right now in the budget. So it's not even a campaign issue. It's mm -hmm. in the budget to do that. And he was asked in Sault Ste. Marie, "Well, what about the northern roads? We have people dying up here, and you're trying to save two minutes off your commute time to get up to the yeah. cottage. We're all trying to make a go here in northern Ontario and live and live a good life. Mm -hmm. And yet we're terrified just to get from one town to another to visit each other, or terrified to drive in the winter time to get to the hospital. Like mm -hmm. it's crazy to think about how much money." is going to Southern Ontario t to buy votes. Yeah. And that's a good point too. The um, access in the winter on the highways, especially in uh, the case where we've got emergency medical services, where you've already got threats of cuts to the services. Mm -hmm. But then if you do manage to be able to get into an ambulance, you've got that two, three hour drive. You can imagine in the winter having to travel through a storm in an ambulance. Yet our ambulance services are also threatening to be cut. So what's behind that? I mean, you were a counselor in Thunder Bay. A lot of those decisions are being made at that level. Yeah. Um, as you've been visiting the smaller communities, is that an issue that's uh, coming up and people are concerned about? Absolutely. We heard about it this morning when I was meeting with constituents in Terrace Bay. Uh, EMS service is extremely important to the north. And, you know, as a, as a city council member in Thunder Bay, uh, we, we control what happens to EMS service. And to give you an idea of what's happening in Thunder Bay, uh, the system for EMS is completely overwhelmed, mm -hmm. completely overwhelmed. Drug and alcohol uh, issues, uh, fentanyl, uh, mental health is just putting such a burden on the EMS services mm -hmm. that we've really felt like we had no choice uh, but to do this. On the flip side, what we need is mental health facilities to probably take care of people and make sure they have their, their basic needs met so that they're not calling the ambulance and then the ambulance is sitting at the hospital for an hour, two hours waiting to unload people because those people are taken care of in a proper, in a proper facility that is fully staffed. Yeah. And once we do that, I think those we're going to see a bigger change in, in the EMS service and, and hopefully more resources coming up up the North Shore. Um, Eva, I was just speaking to this one, one gentleman. He was saying, you know, this, this lady had to wait almost two hours for EMS. And I'm looking into it, and it's it, there's just no people. There's, they're short staffed. Like we just we don't pay them what they need to be paid to come to work to do the job they do. That's that's it. The, this this is the market that's taken over right now. Yeah. And we need EMS workers. We need mental health. We need counselors, like mental health counselors. And we need to do this yesterday. Mm. And I don't think the problem's going to get better. Uh, I think we will see as people start coming out of COVID and everyone has their stressors. It's a lot of bad things happen during COVID. Um, I think this is going to be the, the next big crisis that we're going to face. So obviously um, we're seeing changes in representation of the people who are now running for office. What are some of your thoughts on that? 
Uh, I think it's absolutely wonderful that we're seeing uh, that we've ha- we've been having these conversations for years about not only female participation, but you know, transgender people, LGBTQ um, p- people of color represented in systems that make decisions for us. I think it's uh, it's going to be a strength for us as uh, as you know. Um, not only a riding, but as a province moving forward uh, in this in this election, I I'm really excited about the changes coming, and I'm looking forward to being part of that change and you know paving some new ground for for the younger females coming in. I think um, if I am successful, I'd be the first female MPP for Thunder Bay Superior North. Wow, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about representation. Um, so what are some of the plans that the Liberal Party may have for? Uh, including uh, Indigenous people more in policies and in going forward? You know, that's a great question. Um, we have a vi- very diverse uh, population of, uh, of Indigenous groups and, and band council members. Um, you know, we have the Anishinaabeg na- Nation in, in this area. We have Matawa First Nations. Um, and we have individual uh, bands as well. Um, part of my role, I believe, is to make sure that uh, consultation on appropriate uh, items come up and making sure that we have good contacts that, you know, we can rely on on the chiefs and council of, of each re- reserve to to give me good information, to uh, to work together, because, uh, you know, it's, it's a nation to nation kind of situation that we have that we need no matter, you know, if, whether it's economic development, housing, with the gas line coming in, talking about hydro because it affects them as well. Um, and we need to make sure that they have the autonomy and the authority to to make those decisions and that we can work together to to make this region prosper. Your plans for the next couple of weeks? What are you going to be up to? Yeah, great question. Um, so we, uh, my, we, my team, um, have put together you know a plan I wanted to get out to the region first um, I'm honest with you like my my political experience has been eight years very Thunder Bay centric uh, but then there's the superior north part of it and I really uh, needed to understand the issues and speak with people like yourself and, and community members to understand what the issues are in all of the region not just Thunder Bay um, so I'll be building on that. Um, we have, you know, it's going to be door knocking, talking to people. We're going, we're heading up to, to Beardmore and the Greenstone area uh, later this afternoon, speaking with Red Rock and Nipigon and uh, just making our way, way through. And um, it's going to be a mad dash. Realize it came into this late. I also have um, a lot of experience. So that kind of helps offset the, the timing of it. Um, I have a great support team and staff and my, my partner and my, you know, people are, are, are supportive. Um, I'm really looking forward to this, and uh, I hope to spend a lot of time in the region. Shelby, it was really uh, great of you to spend some time with us and drop in the media center and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, hear about your plans going forward. And I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you very much. And I'm Kim Cross from Scriber Media Center. Thanks for watching. Mm-hmm.